check, check one.
Good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church. We're so happy that y'all are here this morning. What a beautiful weekend it has been, and I am just praising God for this weekend. We've had rainy Saturdays for a while, and I'm praising God for the sunshine. So um, welcome. We are so happy that you all are here this morning to worship together. Well, we have a few announcements before we uh, begin our, our music and just praising God. Well, we have a summer uh, kickoff event that our kids and youth are having. So if you're a parent or grandparent or if your aunt and uncle have kids, then we invite you to this. It's going to be lots of fun. The Sunday, May 16th at 6.30, or sorry, sorry, 5.30, we're going to have inflatables and a pitch and cookout, and this will happen at Eggleston on the playground area. So we invite you to that. Also, this Wednesday at 6.30, we'll have our choir practice. So this is the first time since COVID. <laughs> so this is really exciting. So our choir, you're welcome to come back. In. And if you love to sing and have never been a part of the choir, then we invite you to take part in that. Uh, we're going to be here in the sanctuary so we can social distance and we'll, we'll begin that. So praise God. Let's continue worship. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, maker of heaven and earth, who sent your only begotten Son to come to live with us and then to suffer under Pontius Pilate and crucified and then buried. But in, on the third day, you rose from the dead to be with you together in heaven. And because of this sacrifice, dear Lord, we also are able to be with you eternally. We thank you and we love you for this. And we thank you for this opportunity as a church body to come together to praise you and to glorify you. And may we learn from today's lesson things that we can apply to our lives to become better Christians. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now sing together the hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King. As we continue worshiping together this morning, we want to take a moment and to pray together for the things that are going well in your life and the things that you may be struggling with. And so 
As we come to this point in the worship service, Randy will come around with the mic um, so that you can share prayer requests and praises this morning before we pray. Rick is having a procedure done Wednesday at Clark Memorial, so I'd like you to keep both of us in your prayers. In the bulletin, you'll notice that we have had our great nephew on the prayer list because he had bacterial meningitis. It's, I'm glad to report that he went home this week, um, I think Tuesday, and they don't think there will be any long-term permanent effects from that. So that's a real praise. Um, I'd like you to keep Rocky Harrell in your prayers. He's in Louisville with blood clots, but they say he's improving. I have a praise. I went to um, Florida this past weekend for my niece's wedding, and all that went well, so I'm excited for her and her husband as they start their life together. Would anyone else like to share this morning? Jody Furnish was in the hospital this week. Sure. Jody Sullivan <laughs> was in the hospital this week. Her uh, hip was bothering her terribly, and uh, she came out yesterday. Uh, Still not resolved completely, but um, she's looking for solutions still. Will you join me in prayer? God, we are incredibly thankful that we get to come together um, to praise you and to worship you this morning. Um, just because of who you are, not because of any specific thing, but just because you are our God. And as we gather, we, we have lots of things that are going on, things that are causing us stress and anxiety, um, causing us worry. But we also have things in our lives that are, are great joy and great praise that are happening. And so we want to give you praise through all of it. We want to trust you with those things that are difficult for us and know that you have a plan and are guiding us in those things. And we also want to give you the glory for the good in our lives because we know that it truly comes from you. So, Lord, lead us deeper into our worship this morning, a worship that would leave this place and be a part of every breath that we take. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us now sing together the hymn, Fill My Cup, Lord.
Jesus, as he experienced his last moment with his disciples before he was facing that cruel cross, he had a final meal with them. And as he experienced this time with them, he recognized the importance of communicating what was happening with the journey that they were about to taste as he met with them during this last time luke records when the hour came jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and he said to them i have eagerly desired to eat this passover with you before i suffer for i tell you i will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of god after taking the cup he gave thanks and he said take this and divide it among you for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the new covenant of my blood which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with me at the table. It's a reminder with that last sentence that as Jesus poured out his life for us, we can also betray him at the same time. So I think as we experience this meal together, as we come together to be at his table, that's examining ourselves and looking at our own lives and asking the question, is it I? Is it I? Do I betray my Savior as well, just like Judas? So during this time of reflection, as we give thanksgiving for this incredible gift of eternal life that is laid out before us, at the same time we reflect on our own selves. And am I doing things that betray our Lord and Savior? This morning, as we partake together, we're going to do it differently than we have in the past. And we want to invite anyone who are our guests with us this morning, that it doesn't matter what church you are from, if you are a follower of our Savior, you're welcome to partake in these elements as well. But this morning, um, I will pray, and after I pray, I'm going to have you the opportunity to come up and take up the elements here at front and go back to your seat. And then after you partake them, you can um, just put your cup um, back in the hole in the pew in front of you. So as you play, um, go ahead and we'll start over here. And then when that side's done, we'll have this side, peanut gallery here, and then here. Let's pray. God, as we understand your love for us and the incredible thing of making your table available, we thank you for that. And as we examine our own selves and our own lives, we thank you for that. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.
we celebrate what God has given to us. Come now at uh, this time during our service uh, for our offertory prayer. I would remind folks that our uh, trays, our plates are back at the back. You want to drop your offering off there. And I'd also remind you that uh, this is the first Sunday of the month, and uh, we take up the benevolence offering. Um, if you feel so inclined, let's pray. Father, we come this morning acknowledging you and saying just thank you so very much for all that you do for us. We know that all is yours, and we thank you for blessing us with the gifts that you give us. We come now at this time to give back a portion of that, uh, just to show you that we love you. We continue to plead with you and ask you to watch over us and take care of us. We lift up those that uh, are sick and have ailments. We pray to your healing hand to them. Those that are discouraged or angry or whatever else, we just pray that you would take and comfort them. We pray that you would take and use us as instruments of your extension, that we would have a, a gladness in our heart to go and to take and tell others about you. And he said, is it I? Yes, Lord, I fail you on a regular basis. And I humbly ask for your forgiveness. Thank you for the opportunity to forgive me. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let us sing together the hymn, let us break bread together.
let us also sing together the hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee. Thank you, Linda, for always coming and leading us in worship. And Jonathan, we appreciate you guys so much. Did you miss me? I missed you last week. Um, I was in um, Sunday morning. I'm looking in Google Maps and different places to find where to, to go to church. And I, I found a place to go. And while I was sitting there, I was thinking, I wish I was at home at my church. I love you guys so much. So I appreciate um, my church family and how special that you guys are and i'm also thankful for michael hopper as he um, spoke last week on the message of prayer is about is it about you or is it about god what was the answer to that it's about god yes so i appreciate him so much for for doing that for us two weeks ago when i spoke last i talked about how that we are all priests that we are called to be people that are, in a way, telling the world and pointing to Jesus in all that we do and what we say. And that a priest role is helping to, in, in ancient times, is looking at connecting people who are on a horizontal level to point them to God on a vertical level. And being that, that person that even... That, that person in between. But we recognize with what Christ has done for us that we do not need anyone between us and God, that we can serve a role to point other people to God. But once we do the pointing, our job is then to help each other and point each other to God. There's no one between us as an individual and God. We all have direct access to God. 
So in one way, we serve that role as being a priest. This week, I would like to talk about how we play another role and another metaphor that is in God's Word, reminding us of how important we are in this whole process of being part of the kingdom of God, and that we are a temple. So where do priests work in ancient times? They would work in a temple. And this would be a, a place where that people would go, and this would be... Um, true all over the globe, no matter what a person's understanding of who God was or whatever, that a temple is where someone would go to a sacred space and encounter God. Now, we as Christians recognize that there is one true God, um, and as we recognize that Yahweh is God, we recognize that there was this space that God created a covenant with a people, the Israelites, and then he had them build the tabernacle, which eventually became the temple. But this was a space that was created, a very special space that was created that was to be this, this connection point, this connection point between us here on the earthly realm and God in the, the heavenly realms. This, this temple would be a place to go and have that interaction. And the priest would be there to do the animal sacrifices and such, but a person would walk into this, this holy space and encounter God. And the priest would facilitate that process with them. And as we are living today, have you ever been to a space that you felt like was a holy space? Um, sometimes, yes. I recognize in my own life that there are places that I would um, go that are special to me, that would be a holy place. One of them, personally, for me, would be when I was at church camp. And when I would go to church camp, that is where I um, committed my life to Christ um, when I was 16 years old. And it's also the place where I felt a calling to go into to ministry. And whenever I go back to that, that spot... I felt a special closeness with God in that spot because of the memories that I had of connecting with God there. And I remember even a few years ago going into the chapel and, and being reminded of it being filled with fellow students my age as we sang um, hymns, as we sang um, contemporary songs. And that was a very special spot for me. What I want us to start really thinking about, and I want to point to Scripture here as Paul and, and John talk about what this means to have sacred space and what that means for us and how we're actually called to be a very special component in that. And even as I look at when I think of church camp and my experiences there, what really made that a special experience and made that a special holy place for me wasn't the building or the beautiful grounds or the trees that were there. It was the people that was there when I was there that were connecting and providing an environment to connect me with God. And as I think about it, it wasn't so much the space, but the people who were in that space during that time period. Paul, in a moment we're going to look in Corinthians, but before we get there, I want to mention that this, this city, um, Paul had started a church here years earlier, and he wrote a series of letters responding to things that were going on in the church. And the church at Corinth had a, a tough hill to climb. Corinth itself was a city that would be... And sometimes I, I, I like to compare ancient cities that are in the Bible to modern ones. And the city of Corinth, I would compare most to Las Vegas. Okay, Sin City. And in fact, they even had... Archaeologists have discovered a term that was used in writings saying, oh, you're so Corinthian. And that would mean you're so promiscuous. So depending on what your lifestyle was like, that would be a negative term or a positive term. But Corinth would be sin city. Um, so a lot was going on there. And something that's hard for me to get a hold of sometimes is, you know, before Christianity was there and within the pagan religions that existed at the time, actually immorality was part of people's faith. 
And that for us in a Christian culture is hard to grasp. But things that they would do for worship would be abhorrent to us as Christians. Because if they would go into a temple to the gods, and they would have a fertility god and other types of gods, that actually prostitution would be used in that temple as a part of worship service. And so this is the things that this early church is having to deal with, is to, to change people's mindsets, that there is a holy way to live and there's a non-holy way to live. And what you used to think was a way to worship is something that is, is not healthy at all and, in fact, is quite um, detestable. So as, as Paul is writing to this church at Corinth, he, he's got a lot of convincing to do as the people and the new Christians are coming in are dealing with these issues. And you can imagine um, as, as a church and you're wanting new people to come in and learn about Jesus. But we all, whenever we come in to the body of Christ together, we bring with us our own junk. We bring our own history. We bring our own background with us. And as we enter in to the worship space together, we bring our past with us. And the incredible thing is that the power of God and the Spirit of God can transform whatever is going on inside of here and can make something new in bringing beauty out of ashes with whatever is going on here. So as Paul is recognizing how important it is for the body of believers here to be coming together, that they can't be bringing stuff without realizing it into their worship service. And so the first thing I want to point out is here in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that here in chapter 3, Paul is dealing with division. And within this division, um, people are, are looking to um, say, I'm going to follow Paulos, or I'm going to follow Paul. And Paul is saying, no, we're all under the banner of Christ. And so in, in 16, um, verse 16 of chapter 3, he responds with, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and the Spirit of God dwells in your midst? And if anyone destroys God's temple... God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Now, as we may have heard these words several times, and it may not have that impact, but for these people, these, especially the Jewish followers here, this is huge. I mean, this is mind-blowing. Because for them, an understanding of the temple is this magnificent structure that has existed in one form or another for over a thousand years in this spot in the city of Jerusalem. That the temple is a place that you go that is a sacred space and that as you go into that space, you encounter God there. And here Paul is, is making a very profound statement. They had to like blow their minds when they first heard this. That you yourselves are God's temple. And God's Spirit dwells in your midst. That the people are the temple. Plural. And there's a connection here. Because you've probably heard sermons about how your body is a temple and you should respect it. So you shouldn't do vices and those things because your, your body. And that's true. But also very much here, he's saying that y'all's body. So you together as a body of Christ are the temple and that this is a sacred place and as I think about that yes in my church camp experience and remembering it was my my Sunday school teacher who invited me to camp who was there and his influence on me is, is what made that a sacred place it was I remember um, American Baptist pastor John Roberts from Indianapolis who was doing the message that week as I was listening and hanging on the words as he was sharing God's word to me as a 16-year-old, that these were the words that were life to me and as I was hearing that. And so as Paul is saying this, I'm, I'm, I think I'm starting to get it, that we the people have the opportunity to be in part of that space where people can encounter God. Not that it's us at all as individuals, but we're pointing to that Heavenly Father and His love and His grace and the Spirit of God. 
that can have that impact on us. So Paul is, you can tell he's frustrated here, that he, he's angry and he's saying, this is horrible, that you are destroying God's temple by your division that you're having in the church. And that's bad. You're, you're destroying the sacred space. When people come into the church family, they're hearing division. They're not hearing the holiness of God in that sacred space. Powerful, powerful argument here. But it's incredible because Paul is saying, you are the temple. That's amazing. And then in chapter 6, Paul comes back to this argument again. You see, here in 6, Paul says, and I'll go up even a little above this in 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? No, never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. So Paul is coming back to this, this statement that what you do as a body is important in, in creating the sacred space, but also you as an individual. That what you do with your own body is something that is supremely important to the sacred space of not only the church body, but around you as well, within your family and what is going on within your family. That creating and being a part of this holy space, the sacred space, is critical to understand how important this is. In 19, he continues, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. You see, as Paul is bringing this message to them, the word temple is explosive. And he's now pointing out that what you do within your life, when you're out alone, when you're not with the rest of the body of Christ, is critical to yourself, and also back to the body. That we are called to be this sacred space where people can encounter the living God. You see, up to this point, people understood the sacred space was a building. It was a place that people would go to. Paul is saying here through what Christ has done that we are the sacred space now that the Holy Spirit can work through you and around you to do miraculous space. And so wherever you go, whether it's Sunday or Monday or Thursday, that you're carrying that sacred space with you because the Spirit is inside of you. Have you been to a, a place in your own life where you recognize that when you're in this, this presence of another person, you really respected that person. I remember some of our, our deacons at a deacon meeting were talking about um, how unworthy they felt to be a deacon, but they really respected many of those saints who have gone on before and recognized that when they were around them, they felt like they were around godly people. I know one person that when I was in their presence, I felt the presence of God. Um, one was a Sunday school teacher that I had. And I had the unfortunate privilege of doing his funeral a couple years ago as he died of Lou Gehrig's disease. But um, when I heard that he had contracted um, his disease and went to visit, and as he was talking about um, life and God, I just felt the, the presence of God with him, him as, as he was talking. And... Um, Bless his heart, I remember as I went in to visit, and, he, and I haven't seen him for 10 years or, or more, and he said, 
I know why you're here visiting, but we don't have to talk about um, what's going on with me. And I'm like, I'm just here to talk about whatever you want to talk about. And then as we sat down, he began talking about his disease because that's what was on his mind. Um, and through as he shared about, uh, and his brother had died of Lou Gehrig's disease himself. Um, and so he, he knew clearly what was, was coming. But as he shared with the journey that he was on, at the same time he was sharing how God was with him and was working with him through that experience, that even though he was dealing with a tragedy in his own health, in his own life, that being in his presence was continually pointing to the Savior and was pointing to the love of God that he had experienced in his life as he had lived his life. And another person I remember um, was a lady who was one of our shut-ins when, when I first came. Um, her name was Margaret Nowakowski. And Margaret had a horrible early life in that she lived in Poland. She was married to a minister, and they had a Baptist minister, and they had just had a baby. But unfortunately, this was in the early 1940s. And as Germany was rolling through, they not only took the Jews and sent them to concentration camp, they also took religious leaders, the pastors of all the churches of where they were at. And she experienced tragedy, and her, her husband and child were killed in front of her as they were on getting off the train coming into the concentration camp. But as she told her story, in the same way, she kept pointing to Christ and how amazing Christ is to help her through that journey and eventually destroy the Nazi regime. And she pointed to Christ through all of that. And as I entered into her place, whether she was at home or in her latter days as she was in the hospital, you felt God's presence with her because she knew that living Savior. For all of us, that's who we're called to be. We're called to be people. That as we're experiencing the joys of life are the tragedies of life, as we do so in full awareness of what going, and also authenticity and honesty with, with struggles that we're going through, but as we do so, continually pointing to the Savior as our source of hope, our source of strength, our source of grace and forgiveness, because we all have a past. We've all made mistakes. We make mistakes right now. But as we point to our Savior as our source of, of grace through that, then that space around us becomes a holy space where we can encounter the living Savior, where the people around us can encounter a living Savior. So are you aware in your own life of, of the space around you by your actions and your words and your deeds whether it's in person or online or through writings that you do, the people see a holy space around you. Not that you're holy, but that you're pointing to a risen Savior. Your body doesn't belong to you. Um, I once saw a, a children's book, and it's for little kids, and it's talking about good touch and bad touch, and the title of it was, Your Body Belongs to You. Biblically looking, your body belongs to Christ, and our bodies are all connected as one body together. Our culture is telling us, you belong to you, and that's it. You don't worry about other people. Our culture teaches us sometimes even that your body is a little God. And maybe there's a big God, but we're all little gods. No, that's a distortion of this. We're all to reflect the love of God. We're all to be pointing to God, but we're not God in any way, shape, or form. So for you this morning, are you part of that creating a sacred space around you and what you do. I want us to think about the question this morning. What can I do to be more aware of my role in the kingdom as sacred space? What do I need to do 
in my life to make that so? What changes do I need to make? What parts of my life do I need to allow Jesus to come into, to cleanse, to take care of, what things and attitudes do I have do I need to allow God to come into my life so that when people around me, they see Jesus and they don't see me? My dear friend Margaret, who was in the concentration camp, I made a mistake with her that really made her upset because I went to visit at Hanover College. Um, there was a guest speaker um, at Hanover College for the community to come and listen to. It was another person who had survived the Holocaust. And as she talked about her survival, at the end they had a question answer time, and I, I asked the question, um, you're a Jewish person, and she said yes. And I said, how did this experience affect your faith? And she said, just like Eddie Wiesel in his book, Night, my God died while I was there in camp. And so seeing the stark contrast between these two women who dealt with similar environments, I told Margaret that, and she was so angry because she understood how important it is of what Paul was saying about the sacred space. And she felt badly for her, but at the same time she was angry just like Paul was angry at the church here in Corinth. Because she had given up because of her experiences. Don't give up on the Savior because of your experiences. Whether it's your own personal mistakes or your own personal sin, don't give up on Christ's ability to deal with that. Or maybe you've had to endure horrible things that have nothing to do with you. It's something that other people have done to you, don't give up on Jesus because of that. Don't give up on the opportunity to allow Jesus to come in and cleanse that in your life so that you can be part of his plan of the kingdom of God, of providing sacred space for yourself and other people. What can you do to be more aware of changes you need to make to be a positive role in the kingdom of God. Think about these things as, as Linda plays a little. I'm going to be up here. If you'd like to come up and pray about anything or talk about anything, that opportunity is open as we pause and allow the Spirit to speak to us together.
your body, y'all's body, your body, are all part of the sacred space. You are the body of Christ. In the first chapter of John, it talks about where the, the logos, the, the word came to dwell among us. The body of Christ is you. And we get the privilege of having, being a part of the dwelling of Christ in our midst. It's incredible privilege. Let's pray. God, as we thank you for the privilege of serving you, thank you. Help us to be and understand what it means to be the temple, what it means to be your body, what it means to be a part of the kingdom of God. So God, as we continue to worship and as we go out this week, we thank you for that privilege. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen.